people um, were wrapping up from Journal Club recently. Oh, I don't like the transcript. Do you guys mind if I get rid of the transcript? Can I say that? Okay. Um, okay, but I think we're still recording. Yes, we have a red button on the recording thing. So, um, as people are joining from Journal Club in Google Meet, <laughs> now they're going to transfer to Teams. And we'll, we'll see if we can handle a Zoom later in the day. So um, we'll see if we can get all of our little, um, uh, we got to have a go to meeting at some point too, right? Out of all those, I find go to meeting the most difficult to use. So, um, okay, everyone should know that we are being recorded. Um, and uh, I hope that that is clear. Um, and I do know that we have um, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, it's 101, so I'll do housekeeping before as people continue to join. Um, we have changed the format from Zoom to Teams, mostly because I'm allowed through Texas A&M to use Teams and be the, the manager of the meetings. When we used Zoom, I basically had to make sure that HoCamp would do everything and then she would do it on my behalf and then I would email to everybody. So it was kind of a, a middleman situation, if you will. Um, but Texas A&M lets me use Teams as if I am a true Texas. I mean, I am. Wait, I am a true Texas A&M employee. What am I talking about? I get. I am a contractor, so I have. I have permission to do this. So Teams is easier from a permission standpoint. But if people have difficulty with Teams, or for some reason they want me to change back to Zoom, you just need to reach out to me, and I can consider it to, to go back to the Zoom format instead. Um, so uh, we have been able to test out the recording um, capabilities with teams and dr foster was able to produce or to to take last month's um rounds um and upload it to youtube so um thank you maggie for letting me know that um that uh so so we think that the recording um capability and um viewing it at a later date is still feasible um with teams so that's the explanation from why we switched teams um, also, as I say, each um, uh, month, um, sometimes people get accidentally knocked off of um, uh, the, the invite list. This invite list is very um, unusual because it has a lot of pathologists and it also has a lot of clinicians. Um, so, uh, so if you, uh, <laughs> the clinicians have a journal club basically right before this, so they're already in journal club. And then sometimes if they have the ability to take two hours out of their day, they would transition over to this, um, format. Um, but, uh, uh, the pathologists, um, if you guys are noticing you haven't gotten an invite, um, or haven't heard from me within a month, um, reach out to me because it usually means that you accidentally got knocked off. And I say it every single time. I have no idea why people get knocked off versus um, oops, um, Tori hey, yeah. muting. Over. Any other just joined, it's not muted. Um, so uh, yeah, so just reach out to me if you haven't received any information. Um, and then my third uh, always uh, housekeeping is um, we really appreciate when clinicians um, uh, request cases. Um, uh, Friendship Hospital has been um, amazing and they did like three in a row. Um, we kind of reached out to Texas A&M folks for this current case because I thought it was an interesting example of um, two different processes that um, can happen. And so the overlap of diseases I thought would be a good discussion point. Um, so, uh, I specifically asked Texas A&M if they would be gracious enough to present this case, um, and they are here. Um, but, uh, I really appreciate when people, um, have a case request. I, I don't want to be the person who, um, just gets on and lectures for an hour, um, about kidney disease. Um, I would rather have an actual patient that we're discussing, um, in order to make it, um, worth everybody's time and also benefiting the patient as well. So with that, um, Jenna, did you, I'm not sure which um, of the Texas A&M folks was gonna present. Okay, cool. I'm gonna mute myself. Um, and if you uh, need permission to share screen, I can do that. I, I think I should be okay. I have, um, if anyone who wants to see the blood work, I have those in chronological order and I can pull those up, um, but the blood work isn't terribly interesting. So, um, but I have it available in a Word document if it's helpful. 
Um, so thank you. Um, and I apologize. We would have happily volunteered. Um, but I actually wasn't aware that Ian was back um, until Navity came and talked with me the other day. So it was great. It was great timing. Um, and I appreciate everyone's input on this case because I think she is a little bit unusual. So this is um, Sky. I'll, I'll keep her last name to myself um, just for anonymity's sake. So she's a three-year-old female spade Yorkie. Um, all of her is a whopping 1.6 kilograms. And she presented to her primary veterinarian in October for a dental cleaning, and they did some pre-op lab work. She has a pretty boring history um, with, she is a very much an indoor dog, um, and the, her only exposures that we're aware of is going to a groomer, and other than that is effectively a purse dog. Um, and when they did pre-op blood work in October, she notably had a creatinine of 1.4 and a BUN of 100, and an albumin on in-house blood work of 2.3, which was not flagged as abnormal, um, but I think most of us would consider that pretty abnormal. The rest of her chemistry was normal. She had a CBC that notably had a thrombocytosis of almost 700 and otherwise was unremarkable. And then on uh, urinalysis, she was considered to be euhydrated on exam. She had a 1027 USG, 500 mg per deciliter of protein with a relatively quiet sediment. Um, they, I think because of the discordance between BUN and creatinine, did a fecal occult blood, which came back as non-detective. Um, they treated her for a possible UTI. She was completely asymptomatic at the, that point in time, but they started her on Clavamox with the plan to recheck her. Rechecked her um, a month later. And uh, at that point in time, had... Um, a lot of blood in her urine. It doesn't specify how the UA was obtained. So at that point in time, she had 30 to 50 red blood cells with a couple of whites. Again, asymptomatic and th um, three plus blood and protein. So a little bit hard to interpret. They switched her to a renal diet and then called um, Texas A&M. We had recommended doing send out blood work at that point in time, which they did. And she notably had an SDMA of 27 a BUN of almost 150, a creatinine of 1.3, albumin was 2.3, um, and then was hypercholesterolemic at 350. She had a persistent thrombocytosis with an otherwise normal CBC. A culture was sent out and was no growth, and she was still reported to be clinically normal. And then that was when she was referred to Texas A&M. Um, at that point in time, we performed a full abdominal ultrasound, which was uh, really unremarkable, including renal architecture, repeated lab work, and that was just a couple days later. Um, and at this point in time, her creatinine had increased to 1.6. Her BUN was a little bit less discordant at 70. Um, and her albumin was 2.6. And again, she was hypercholesterolemic at close to 300. She had a quiet sediment, 1029 UA, uh, 3 plus SSA, 300 protein. We performed a UPC, it was 22 at that point in time. Uh, blood pressure, borderline hypertensive, upper 140s to 160, discharge on telmisartan um, at a 0.6 mg per kg per day dose, omega-3 fatty acids, started doxy pending a full vector burn panel through NC State which eventually came back as um, un undetected. And then um, and then had another uh, COAG panel um, and some recheck blood work a few days later in preparation for a renal biopsy. And she was um, hypercoagulable on a VCM. COAG panel was consistent with uh, some inflammation. She had high fibrinogen, it was mildly elevated. Um, and elevated dimers. And so she was, um, that point in time, blood pressure was consistently in the 160s. Her telmisartan was increased. She was started on Plavix and then returned with those drugs discontinued for 24, uh, Plavix discontinued for about a week and um, telmisartan for 24 hours pre-renal biopsy. So that's her, her whopping history as a three-year-old dog who lives in a purse. Um, 
and so we biopsied her and I don't know uh, if um, you want to show some of her slides. Yes, I do. I think I'm sharing the whole screen. Oh, now it's asking me. Go to security panel. Oh, One second. Um, it does not want me to share my screen. I know I did this last time and I forgot to redo it this time. Um, You might be able to see, yeah, you guys are at least seeing this, so at least I can do it this way. Um, hopefully you guys are seeing our um, website. Yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, just, yeah, it's, um, I'm gonna talk about photos really, from photos really quick, because um, I think at least this can, um, show you the types of lesions we were seeing um, on this uh, biopsy. Um, the uh, it's a three year old dog. So keep that three and a half year old dog, right? Um, <laughs> so in a normal kidney biopsy from a healthy three and a half year old dog, I should really not see any evidence of sclerosis or aging or, um, you know, nephron loss. Um, a, a three-year-old, especially a small breed dog, should have pretty normal, healthy kidneys with normal glomeruli um, for, for many years of their life. Um, and so if I go back to my estimate of how many glomeruli were involved by this, uh, there were 32 glomeruli and 20 of them were globally sclerotic. So um, we already have two-thirds loss of our nephrons, um, which is immediately concerning. And so um, to, to compare a globally sclerotic glomerulus to a, um, a non-sclerotic um, glomerulus, we have two right next to each other. So here's our glomerulus that has completely lost all of its capillary lumens. Um, the um, uh, matrix that forms the mesangium and the glomerular base of the membrane has basically made one coagulum, or not even a coagulum, but one um, um, aggregate of material and you have a few um, nuclei that are hanging on. So they were originally probably mesangial cells, maybe some endothelial cells, but they often just kind of um, ball down or scar down. Um, and then you can see Bowman's capsule that's around it um, with an adhesion between the glomerular top and Bowman's capsule. Um, now, if we compare this to a glomerulus that is, is still patent, it's still perfusing, um, we have open capillary lumens. I'm gonna get a little bit higher, one second. Um, there are a few possible adhesions between the glomeruli and glomerular capillary walls and Bowman's capsule, um, and it might be a little bit easier to see on the adjacent serial section that was stained with H&E, um, but so we might have a few um, synechia. We have some thickening of some of the capillary walls, although other portions of the glomerular tuft have normal thickness of capillary walls. Um, and so I'm going to ask one of the pathologists on the call, let's ask Maggie Martinez, how many mesangial cells are you allowed to have in a normal um, uh, mesangial zone um, with uh, uh, in a healthy dog? So nervous. Two to three? Perfect. Why are you nervous? You know that stuff. Um, okay. So um, you're allowed to have two to three, um, and we have indeed two to three in most of our regions. Maybe occasionally you might get up to four. And so this is an overall um, um, uh, type of assessment. This isn't just looking through an, an entire core of 30 glomeruli, finding one segment that has four nuclei, maybe one segment that has five nuclei, and getting scared. It's, it's you know, repeatability, commonality, frequency, and then severity. So like, let's say if you had 30 glomeruli and you had one glomerulus that had 50 nuclei <laughs> inside a mesangial zone, that would be a lesion. So you really do have to kind of interpret in your brain the number and the severity, the gradation of the lesion, and then how commonly you see that lesion. So we're not seeing way too much um, on that particular glomerulus, and we might see more later. 
Um, this particular section over here might be that I think it's still it is still the same um, section, but remember we're cutting through the glomerular tuft. So but the one that got stained with trichrome was now near the end of that glomerular tuft because we're cutting through a globe. Think about it that way. And so this is kind of just the the, the bottom part of that globe. Um, OK, I'm going to ask now. I know I'm, I'm just putting people on the spot now. This is kind of fun. I'm going to ask, um, oh, I'm going to ask Hocamp this question. Hocamp, happy birthday, everybody. Tell, tell uh, Hocamp happy birthday. Um, what uh, features on the Jones stain, what's the one thing that we're trying to assess with on the on the Jones silver stain, Dr. Hocamp? Spikes and holes. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. So we're looking at the glomerular base of membrane when we're looking at the silver stain. And you really do need a good silver stain. This isn't something that can be done um, adequately by every single laboratory and um, Texas A&M has a very good st silver staining protocol. Um, and so what we would look at is to see, I'm going to zoom way in, we're going to do enhance like we're on CSI or something like that, enhance. Um, so we're looking to see, do we have areas where there are two layers of the glomerular base membrane? And sometimes we do. So you have a dark line, you have a little area that's non-staining right here. And Ho can't please tell me if the arrow is actually showing. Anybody? Move it around again. Yeah, it's showing. Yeah. Okay, so that little tiny non-staining area is something. Now, it could be a deposit. It could be mesangial cell cytoplasm. It could be um, uh, some kind of lucency because the GBM isn't normal. Um, but there is kind of a little tiny non-staining region, and then there's another dark region. So the silver stain is specifically looking for base at uh, base membrane material. Um, it also is important when you're looking at mesangial zones. Um, so uh, sorry, my husband's flight is got canceled, so that's why I'm looking at my watch because I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to actually get him back from Philadelphia right now. <laughs> so, um, so. Looking at mesangial zones, um, you want to have the silver stain stain that region. You want it to be black, gray, dark gray, black. Um, and then um, you want the, your GBM to be black as well. Um, so that's for that particular glomerulus. We're going to zoom out now oops, um, and look at another set of glomeruli. Um, again, serial sections. Um, and so the important point of this particular glomerulus has the um, same kind of n somewhat normal glomerular base membrane thickness in many regions, whereas other regions are too thick. And my internal control of where what I think is too thick and too thin is comparing the glomerular capillary wall with a, a normal base membrane, um, tubular base membrane. So here we have a normal tubule at the bottom of the image, kind of at like five, 6 p.m. And we have a pretty good normal um, thickness of the of the tubular base membrane. You want to do this with a PAS um, stain. And so if I compare that normal tubular base membrane to my glomerular capillary wall, it's it's thicker. And so that means that glomerulus has segmental thickening of the glomerular capillary wall. Okay, so now I'm going to put um, Dr. Foster. Are you on here? Or friendship at all? Okay, well then I'm going to put Peter on this because Peter's our pathologist as well. Um, oh, I forgot my question I was going to ask. Um, oh, goodness gracious. Now I had a really good question and now I can't remember what my question was. Um, oh, the, no. <laughs> are you? <laughs> I'm going to go back to my picture and see if that responds. Okay, oh, I know what I was going to say. What my question for Peter, hopefully you can speak. If not, you can type it into the text. I know last time you had problems with your microphone. But um, what would be this cell that's hanging out here? Um, what, what cell type do you think that is? What cell type is hanging out there? Yeah, what's the name of that cell cell that would be in this in that region? Like a podocyte? Perfect, okay. okay. So there are two types of cells that live on the outside, the abluminal side of the capillary wall. Um, and there are either podocytes or parietal epithelial cells, and it's very difficult in some cases to tell which is which. Um, so 
this particular one has some protein droplets in him. So he's probably a podocyte. Podocytes like to phagocytose protein droplets, probably stuff that got um, pushed out or filtered through the glomerular base membrane and into Bowman space. And there's just globs of material. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a leaky glomerular filtration barrier. And so the podocytes will phagocytose some of that, that, that pink material. This is definitely a podocyte. Just trust me, I can tell by his nucleus, he's definitely a podocyte. These are definitely podocytes out here. Um, they're kind of almost, you know, like sticking out towards urinary space. And then your parietal epithelial cells would be lining this Bowman's capsule structure. So usually they're squamous and that nucleus right there is a squamous nucleus um, or a nucleus of a squamous cell. So that is a parietal epithelial cell. Um, so you should only basically have two layers of um, cells. You should have a podocyte layer and then a parietal epithelial cell layer. And sometimes they get um, uh, kind of, you know, squished together or pushed pressed together. Um, so that's our good PAS stain. Um, and then the silver stain, again, now this is a little bit better of a silver stain where, or not, I shouldn't say better. It, it doesn't show that same remodeling we saw in the first glomerulus, glomerulus that I showed you where we had double contours. This one looks like it's a fairly like, you know, um, single line. Um, of the glomerular base membrane. Okay, so now I'm going to do one more. Let's do one more quiz question. Um, wait, have I already asked Haley a question? I haven't, had I? Haley, what is the difference between segmental versus global when we're talking about glomeruli? Mm -hmm. So segmental means that less than 50% of the glomerulus is affected by a change, whereas global means that greater than 50% of the glomerulus is affected. Correct. And I do want everybody here that she specifically said a V glomerulus. So that's what looking within a single glomerulus. This isn't just across the whole population. It's within a single glomerulus. Um, and then that would be different than, let's say, um, focal or diffuse. Mary Nabity, what's the difference between focal and diffuse? Oh, sorry. I was getting the kids uh, lunch. Um, focal is in, um, I can't remember how many Glomer uh, shoot. Um, diffuse is lots of glomeruli affected, and focal is like a few. I don't know right. if there's a percentage so, off, though. That's, yeah, that was just kind of the transition or, or the difference between segmental is kind of half of the tuft versus the whole tuft, and then focal versus diffuse is half of the glomeruli in the whole sample versus all of the glomeruli in the sample. And so, and I will say that even MD nephropathologists kind of fudge it a little bit. <laughs> so there might be focal processes that actually end up affecting 75% of the glomeruli. Um, and they kind of always, you know, kind of go back and forth. Well, this technically started out as a focal process and it just got worse and worse and worse. And so now we technically have crossed that border zone of greater than 50%. Um, but it started out as focal, so we'll keep it focal in the diagnosis. And so I get that the terminology is confusing, and I get it's annoying that veterinarians just kind of adopted what the MDs did and, you know, still use the same verbiage. But um, it is important because when you have a disease process that starts out with focality, that means that you have to get a sufficient number of glomeruli in your biopsy in order to rule out that process. So if it's a focal process and you it only hits 10% of the glomeruli, you really need a good sample of at least 10 to maybe 20 glomeruli to be sure you're going to capture it in your biopsy needle. And then the other thing for pathologists that are on this call that are not necessarily nephropathologists, our head thinks of focal as a single lesion. I'm doing, I'm showing, I'm hoping you guys can see my screen because I'm making hand things as well but I'm realizing that my hand is the same color as my closet door. <laughs> so for pathologists that are just straight trained pathologists, focal means single, right? It means like you have a focal histiocytoma, there's just one. But in kidney terms, it means it could be a glomerulus here, and then you could have five normal glomeruli, and then you could have another glomerulus that has the same lesion all the way at the end of the core, and that's still a focal process. So nephropathology really mixed up and messed with the, the terminology. Um, and veterinary nephropathologists adopted what the MDs did, whether that's right or wrong, I'm not sure, but we, we that's, that's the terminology we use. I know this is a lot, but I'm trying to make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to different types of terms. 
Um, okay, so that was um, the the kind of the the the, the take homes we saw on the histology, where every so often we might see a little bit of mesangial hypercellularity. We had segmental thickening and kind of ir irregular irregularities of the glomerular base of membrane. Um, we had a lot of, and that's what this picture highlights. Look at all of these pink blobs here on the PAS. These are all globally sclerotic glomeruli. Here is a patent glomeruli. This one's actually functioning. Um, we are kind of near the capsule. The capsule, if, if you're going to have a scar in a kidney, it's usually going to hit capsular. Um, regions first or subcapsular regions first. So it might be that that this is, you know, the the way the biopsy captured the number of glomeruli is is affected by the fact that we got like a subcapsular sample. Um, but I still think it's important to say that this is a three year old dog and look how already inflamed um, the interstitium is. There are regions where we have a lot of fibrosis. We have a lot of tubular atrophy, and I'm going to zoom in to show you guys tubular atrophy in for just a moment in the PAS. Tubular atrophy is characterized by thickened tubular base membranes. So thickened, they're often wrinkled, and the epithelial cells that are lining those thickened, wrinkled TBMs are usually atrophic. Um, sometimes they can be very weirdly shaped. They can have hypertrophied nuclei. They're really just hanging on for dear life. And so if you compare these tubules on this edge of the, the, the right edge of the image to the tubules that are on the left ed, edge of the image, which are much healthier, they have a good brush border. For those of you who were calling into Journal Club when we were talking about um, acute tubular injury, um, acute tubular necrosis scoring, we were talking about loss of that brush border being part of scoring of injury for tubular necrosis. And this particular region has very good uh, maintenance of the brush border, but our scarred regions have lost the brush border. Okay. So I was scared. These do not look like great kidneys for um, a three-year-old dog. The trichrome is also very good to show us the degree of fibrosis. Um, we have pretty thick fibrosis here that's, um, that is widely separating the tubular um, uh, profiles. So this tubule is widely separated from this other tubule. And think about it, anything that was going through a peritubular capillary in that region, so all the oxygen that was coming through that peritubular capillary now has to cross through a whole bunch of collagen in order to perfuse that tubule. So that's an, like it delays oxygenation, if you will. And then likewise, anything that these tubules would reabsorb um, that would be a, a, maybe it's reabsorption because it's albumin or albumin products and they really want to get it back into circulation and or it's a very nice uh, it's glucose, you know, it's re reabsorbing all the glucose. All of that glucose now that is reabsorbed by these proximal tubules has to go a longer distance to get to that peritubular capillary. Um, if it's something that's a toxin or something like that, it can get um, changed or um, maybe a, a decreased um, reabsorption capability again, because of the amount of fibrosis. So um, these do not look like good kidneys for a three-year-old dog. Do you guys have any questions about the histology? I'm going to check and see. If, is there anything in the chat? Dr. C? Yeah. Um, I feel, not in this case, but when I see chronic renal infarctions, I feel like in those wedges, a lot of times I'll see glomeruli that look sclerotic or obsolescent. But I don't know if that's just because of the infarction or if that's true. Do you see things like I don't know how to ask this question, but is that a common thing you see? Yeah, and it, it's about it's about time frame. So uh, and I, is your question kind of more of like which came first? Did the glomeruli scar first and then that might be why we have fibrosis or did you know, did we occlude a vessel kind of at the corticomedullary junction and now everything is scarred? Is that kind of what you're discussing? Yes. Yeah. OK. So that's why that's why it's helpful from um, when you're doing animal research um, to have the whole kidney so you can check for those vascular changes or see if there's vascular obstruction. Um, there are subacute types of infarction um, where 
the lesion might have happened a couple of days ago. So imagine, I don't know, hyper hypercoagulability and we have thrombi inside uh, you know, a an arcuate or maybe like an interlobular lobular vessel. There are plenty of examples where just the tubules have died and you can still see the glomeruli hanging on for dear life, but those are very short term. And then after I would say uh, a couple of weeks, if there hasn't been reestablishment of blood flow, then the glomeruli will also scar down. So the typical things that we think about in cats, which are very fibrotic and the glomeruli are also completely wrinkled, collapsed, um, sclerotic, is probably vascular damage that never resolved or maybe very, very long-term ischemic damage that just kept like making more and more interstitial fibrosis and eventually the glomeruli got caught up in it as well. Um, so it just depends on the time frame, and then sometimes it depends on what type of, whether you've got the sample to see the vascular changes. So Maggie Martinez has specifically asked, were there any vascular changes on this biopsy? Um, and um, uh, I don't think we had the, um, uh, really great vessels because think about the the core. I'm I'm pulling it up right now. I know you guys can't see it because of the way the screen sharing is happening. Um, uh, there is a little bit of thickening of an interlobular artery I have here, but then I have plenty of interlobular arteries inter being in between the lobules that look normal. Um, so I think it is kind of patchy arteriosclerosis, Maggie. Um, and it, it's definitely not the worst I've seen. I usually, I can often see really bad arteriosclerosis in older, older cats. Obviously we're looking at a, a young dog, um, but um, uh, it, there's a little bit of arterial damage. And I was just kind of going through this in my head yesterday. I was looking at um, a, a research animal and the concept of like, think about how long and tortuous sometimes our art arteries can be. And if there is one little hair point, hair point turn where it impedes blood flow um, and we just don't capture it on that particular um, biopsy core, we're, we basically are left guessing, right? Um, and that's where histology has severe limitations, in my view, is, is when it comes to um, re or, or arterial disease, especially of these small caliber arteries. Um, everything in the kidney, once you get into the kidney parenchyma, is considered a small caliber artery. Um, it's not even a medium cal caliber artery. So if, they're, if they have any kind of pinpoint turn, or maybe they have a small thrombus, or maybe they have a small region of arterial degeneration, if you didn't get that gorgeous section that has it, it's almost like that migrating grass on that you just assume is there, but you don't see it. So um, it, it's it would be great if we could have a better, um, more definitive, more um, specific way to say this was truly vascular injury. This was not ascending pyelonephritis. This was not you know previous toxicity, and now we have scar. Um, it would be lovely if we could have an IHC that said, yep, yeah, this was truly due to ischemic injury and not due to other pathogenesis. Um, any questions? Um, when you see more diffuse arterial damage, do you know if there's a high correlation? So that's a good question. Um, I always assume that there might be problems with hypertension when I see, um, if, I get, if I get lucky and get that lesion, and I always ask the clinician, um, and so we'll talk a little bit. I, I know I've been rambling along about the pathology, but we're going to get to the fun stuff, which is the EM right next. Um, and so there are plenty of times where I see histologic or EM lesions that I'm like, I really feel this dog has at least, if maybe not always hypertensive, has periods of increased blood pressure. Um, and obviously if we were able to monitor for long periods of time and, and we're able to, to, to know whether or not they have spikes in their blood pressure. Um, so, and a lot of times when I ask, the clinician comes back and says, oh yeah, like it, you know, it, the blood pressure was reported normal on the, on the form, but he's on antihypertensive meds and he had previous hypertension. So, so yeah, so I, I think that pathologists do a poor service to um, uh, evaluating vascular damage when it comes to hypertension in veterinary medicine. It was, I, I'm very attuned to it because I had been at UNC for so long and hypertension is so important in humans. So I, I, a small artery, it jumps out at me where I see arterial damage. But I think 
veterinary medicine isn't great at, um, or veterinary pathology, I should say, isn't great at saying like, oh, yep, this is a damaged artery. We have evidence of hypertension. Okay, I'm going to go to the EM next, I think. Let's see. Yep. Okay, so, so, go ahead. Well, is there, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just in the doctor's, he mentioned that this was a really hard dog to biopsy. And because it's so small, and I thought it might be good to at some point have a discussion of the considerations with the biopsy. Yes, we will. Yeah, let's let's we can talk about that. Um, and that'll be all once I'm done with pathology, all the clinicians can discuss this because then it almost is like, how do you biopsy a cat? How do you biopsy a small cat? That kind of thing. Um, EM wise, this was a interesting EM because I will say that I had already had the IF back. The IF came earlier than the EM. Um, and so the IF showed some degree of positive staining um, and it did have a granular profile. Um, it was mostly in the mesangium and I will show you those pictures next. But um, right now um, the EM is kind of one that's going to give us the answer. So um, we have here, which is the glomerular base membrane of one capillary loop. We have glomerular base membrane of another capillary loop. Um, we have the endothelium. And what is interesting, what's the um, key word we talk about when we talk about endothelium and its shape? Um, and I'm going to ask that to friendship. So somebody in friendship, what's the cool word about um, glomerular endothelial cells? If you're speaking, you're muted. Can you hear me? Yep. Sorry, can you repeat? The, so when we're talking about glomerular endothelial cells, what's really cool about their shape? What's their specific um, morphology? That they're fenestrated? Correct. So they're fenestrated. So they're going to have tiny little pinpoint holes all along. Think of about a pancake amount of cytoplasm. It's very flattened. And then you poke a whole bunch of holes through all of them. And so when you're looking at the endothelial cells, um, you want to see like, like a little blob of cytoplasm and then a hole and a little blob of cytoplasm and a hole. So here you can actually still see the fenestration. So we have a little blob of cytoplasm and this is an area that would be a hole that was that fenestra going through um, the endothelial cell. So in this particular endothelial cell it looks pretty good. You always have like some little blobs that are kind of hanging out and like pushing into the capillary lumen. But in general, we have pretty good um, retention of, of the endothelial cell fenestra. Um, but what's cool about this, what's interesting is that all of a sudden when you look at the glomerular base membrane, we have quite a variation in thickness. Um, and so here you have glomerular capillary wall that is almost two or three arrowheads thick, whereas your adjacent, your other portion of the capillary wall is basically the thickness of one of my arrow cursors, right? So that variation in thickness and then how it kind of undulates on the um, abluminal surface. So um, the uh, subepithelial surface is kind of wrinkly or wavy. Um, and then the other kind of reason this picture is quite good is that it's showing you you have foot processes. Well, sorry, let's say you have loss of the foot processes. So this right here is endothelial cell cytoplasm and you have none of those really cute little like um, interdigitations that go um, from the podocyte to the glomerular base membrane. You should basically see this little tiny tendril here. You should have seen 50, 60 of those. And instead you're seeing one huge big old um, blob of cytoplasm of the podocytes. Um, and so then as we look more and more at the glomerular capillary walls, again, you can see this multi-lamination. You have tiny little um, areas where the lamina densa has material and then a little bit of lucency. So you have a, an electron dense region, an electron lucent region, an electron dense lesion. So we have all of these kinds of um, multi-lamination and it's kind of more prominent in that sub podocyte area. This is where our podocytes are located. Um, and so, uh, and it's segmental. So remember what we talked about, here's another capillary loop that has multi-lamination. And remember when we looked at the histology, we also said that the GBM lesions, the capillary wall thickness lesions were also segmental. So this is kind of fitting that we have these weird segments of the capillaries that are abnormally um, uh, shaped and have an abnormal thickness. Um, here we're looking at a glomerular capillary loop. This over here is the mesangial zone. This is a little bit of mesangial cell cytoplasm. 
Um, for the pathologists in the group that like kidney, um, the way you can tell a mesangial cell cytoplasm from, uh, apart from a, a mesangial deposit is that the cytoplasm should have cell membrane around it. So these have all that kind of dense line. So that's definitely a cell membrane outlining. Wow, I just got really congested all of a sudden. I'm like, I feel like I need to sneeze. And if I sneeze, it's going to be so loud. I apologize. Um, but um, that is all lined by cell membrane. And this is all uh, mesangial cell cytoplasm. Here is the mesangial zone. We come out here, and this is our capillary loop. And we have some areas of the capillary wall, again, that are basically the thickness of my cursor. So that looks pretty normal. But we have these huge regions. Look how much abnormality of this glomerular base membrane is here. We could probably do 10 or 12 arrowheads in this region. And then Friendship. What do you think about Friendship Hospital? What do you think about Fenestra on this particular um, region of the uh, capillary loop? Do you think there's normal or abnormal? Uh, they seem very abnormal. Correct. <laughs> I'm throwing you some softballs because I know you guys are also busy probably dialyzing as we speak. But, um, but yeah, so you have you have blebs of cytoplasm, and then you have the opposite endothelial cells with the good GBM. <laughs> this is good GBM, and they have good they have maintained their good fenestra. Um, again, podocyte foot processes are diffusely effaced. Um, globally effaced is probably the appropriate word because we're talking about with one one glomerulus. Um, so now we're just going to be seeing the exact same thing. So here is thickened irregular glomerular base membrane. This little um, electron dense region here is the red blood cell. But so so I've already kind of gotten to the fact that there's abnormalities in the glomerular base membrane. And then the other thing that starts to happen are oh, these guys little abnormalities. These little guys are projecting towards like there's little nubbins of, of GBM that's projecting towards the urinary space. These little tendrils here are what we call microvillus transformation of the podocyte cytoplasm. So podocyte cytoplasm here is all effaced by the foot processes, but then we have these tiny little microvilli that are be just being formed by the podocyte. Nobody knows why they do it, but they seem to do it pretty well. Um, and it basically are these tiny little tendrils that are just going out into urinary space. Um, the other lesion we saw in this, we get to see in this um, particular um, case is that we do have electron densities. So remember I told you that the, the mesangial cell cytoplasm should have a good line around it. So this is mesangial cell cytoplasm, but outside of that line, we get this um, area of smudginess. Um, and that smudginess is an electron dense region. Here's a little bit area of smudginess. Um, and so Sometimes we can see it and it's just, here's here's even more smudginess next to a little bit of cytoplasm. Here's a little area of smudginess. And so we're always kind of, we, we see this, this kind of material in mesangial zones and we always kind of ask ourselves like, is it something important or is it um, uh, just kind of uh, a, a lot of extra cellular matrix that got um, pushed there? Um, and so in this particular case, we do have a little bit of um, labeling of that same zone by our IF stains. Um, so now if we go to the IF stains. So, so this is the stuff where I'm like, uh, these might be actual immune deposits here. And the reason I think they could possibly be immune deposits is because they have a little bit of IS, IF positivity. However, this is very, very minor in the overall spectrum of the changes of the glomerulus as compared to the things that are going on in the GBM. So even if we're trapping or we're having a little bit of labeling with the, um, with the uh, because there's immune deposits or immunoglobulins that are in there, um, and that's the, the little bit of granularity that's in this um, mesangial zone, these glomeruli are kind of already starting to um, undergo sclerosis as well. So they're kind of small. But even though we're seeing a little bit of staining and a little bit of electron density, that's quite minor in comparison to what was going on to the glomerular base membrane. IgM always stains this stuff because IgM is very sticky. As we learned in our previous talk from Journal Club that IgM likes to bind to certain proteins that are important. Um, there is a little bit of granularity with the C3 as well. So if there is material that's kind of sticking here in the mesangium, it does seem to be at least activating the complement system in, to a minor degree. And then the uh, the lambda light chain also shows that granularity as well within the mesangial zones. So 
Um, I, I tried to clarify in the discussion of this report that I think the main reason this dog is having such advanced glomerular disease um, and proteinuria is because the abnormalities of the glomerular base membrane and the podocyte put process effacement. But amongst all of that, there also seems to be a little bit of a wave of um, a mu complex or immunoglobulins getting, and it might not even be a mu complexes, right? It's a, it's just, we, we're only standing for immunoglobulins and a little bit of complement. But it seems to be getting trapped kind of right in the mesangial zone, which is where we're seeing those electron densities. Um, Hokiam, the SDS page, was it, did it have um, more support of uh, immunoglobulin or immune complex disease, or was it kind of just a generic? N no, it, it was not. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, sorry, my internet had cut out for a bit. Um, you know, it was there was significant evidence of glomerular and tubular damage, but um, there's only a, one very faint band above 200 kildaltons, and there's certainly not one at the top of the gel. This is not surprising, given you know most of the time I see these with an MPGN, where I'll see the multiple bands above 200. Sometimes with MGN, but so even with the urine, you know, we're not we're not straight thinking this is a an overtly like very um, inflamed glomeruli. This doesn't seem to be a GN a glomerulonephritis. Um, it 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 does seem to be an abnormal GBM. And yes, we're seeing a little bit of um, positive staining with the IF. Um, a little bit of smudginess with the um, uh, EM in the mesangial zones only. And so what do you do with those cases when, you know, so I guess, what do you do with those? What did you do with the case? <laughs> we have continued to treat her um, supportively. So renal diet, omega-3 fatty acids, Thomasartan and Plavix. Um, we, I, I wanted to hear if there were any other recommendations. So I hadn't changed anything. She had a pretty profound response to Thomas Sarton, um, originally when her EPC went from 22 to 11, um, which obviously, you know, it's still a double digit UPC, but, um, half of, of where we had started. Uh, so we had stayed the course for now, um, but I'm 100% open to critique um, any and any other suggestions. I, I will say that probably friendship has been the the group that's probably seen the most or interacted with the most of these these weird. And so, um, as as I'm not sure if JD is available um, to to discuss what he would do, but um, as we're getting as I'm searching to see if JD is there. Um, I, we do see these abnormalities of the glomerular base membrane, and they are most most often in Yorkies. If it's not a Yorkie, it's usually a small breed terrier, small like I mean maybe not a maybe not a purse dog, but a small terrier. It's very it's very uncommon, although it has been seen in large breed dogs with these types of GBM abnormalities. Um, if we saw this GBM abnormality and it was a very young dog, like a puppy. Um, especially if it was male, um, we would worry more about um, type 4 collagen mutations. Um, I don't think that, uh, it, it's not that we've completely ruled out the possibility that the Yorkie type of GBM changes could be related to type 4 collagen, um, but um, the limited amount of sequencing we've done hasn't shown um, abnormalities in type 4 collagen, and there are many other proteins in the glomerular base membrane um, also, the fact that if it's the if the podocyte is the problem, and it's actually like more of a of a primary podocyte problem, and the podocyte is part of the cell lineage that maintains the glomerular base membrane, then that could also be another pathogenesis of this type of glomerular base membrane abnormality, where you have a primary podocyte problem, and then because it's defective in whatever way it can't maintain its side of the GBM. And that's why you have almost, you you know, you have more commonly sub and sub epithelial um, undulations. Um, so there's a lot of um, theories of why it seems to be mostly small tor terriers. And then we have not done statistical analysis to uh, confirm it, but oftentimes they have either a previous history of hypertension or they are currently hypertensive at the time of biopsy. So again, blood pressure, what if they, ha they have um, episodic, 
you know, spikes in blood pressure and that kind of like blows apart their glomerular capillaries. And so what we capture on the biopsy is kind of like almost a, a, a an attempt at resolution where the GBMs are kind of irregular and undulating and folded and whatever, because there was a previous um, hypertensive um, uh, episode in their life. Um, so there's a lot of things that could, that, that what we're capturing might, might be just signals of previous types of damage, um, but uh, we don't know yet. Um, clinicians who've done, who've dealt with these kinds of GBM abnormalities, especially in small, ter small terriers, what would your um, discussion and recommendations be? Anyone? Shelly? Wait, can you repeat the question? <laughs> Just what, if you have a small breed terrier that has these abnormalities in the glomerular base membrane, what's your kind of go-to <laughs> treatment plan? And she's still proteinuric. She still has a pretty high UPC, although she's responded well to Telmasartan. Larry, you've Rick. unmuted, so I'm, I'm gonna tap. I'm gonna tap on Larry. Yeah, I, I, I can you hear me? Yep. Um, well, I think for this type of injury, this kind type of disease, I think what's been proposed is what we know to do at the moment. I think the other the other thing that I like to always emphasize is we always want to get the proteinuria down to zero but when you've got such intense disease i think that's an unlikely expectation and uh, and certainly you do everything you can to reduce the proteinuria but uh, don't live with the expectation that geez if i did something else i'm going to get this to normal because it's very likely that the the damage is so um, so pervasive that uh, it's always going to leak and you're never going to achieve that goal. Yeah, and I, and I think when even so, no matter what the pathogenesis, even if it is truly an ICGN, like a, a chronic membranous, but there has already been enough damage to have some segmental sclerosis, um, we try in our reports to communicate that the segmental sclerosis is always going to be there. And so it could, this dog could be, remain, could remain proteinuric to some degree. Um, so don't expect that as soon as you initiate truly, if it was truly even, we know it's definitively ICGN, even if you're treating appropriately for the ICGN, that dog is still going to have glomerular scarring and you would expect some degree of proteinuria in those patients. Mm -hmm. But I think we, as clinicians, we always think, well, we're going to put it on telemosart and we're going to, we're going to do a low protein diet and, and all of these things. And that's going to magically fix the proteinuria, but it, it, it's likely not to fix. If it improves it, that's great. And you try to maximize the improvement uh, to a nader, but uh, don't be so unrealistic that you're going to fix it entirely. Sometimes we do, but probably not in this kind of lesion. Do you, being that being that this dog is a, a a princess purse dog, do we know relatives? Like, do they know the breeder at all? No, we don't have a lot of history, and um. She is reported to be a Yorkie, which I think they got her from a Yorkie breeder. She doesn't look like a Yorkie. I mean, oh, okay. she she's like a s color dilute whitish tear, like teen. I mean, one point six kilo, pretty pathetic looking creature. Um, she's not making it in the show ring for sure. Um, so. I mean, do you think it's like when they say a Yorkie breeder? Do you think it's like a not a like not a great like a not a an official? Yeah, she certainly doesn't look like anything official to me. I mean, when when I first saw the dog, I was like, wait a second, this is the Yorkie. Um, so I don't know that that is truly if she's truly a hundred percent Yorkie. I was curious if you don't mind, Doctor C, with um, I know that there's been quite a description and discussion about quote Yorkies with this discordant BUN and I know that you've had some biopsies have you seen similar biopsy results in that subset of dogs where they are historically um kind of borderline azotemic with these very discordant BUNs you know compared to their creatinine I haven't looked at that specifically but that would be I mean the goal is and we've talked with Emma uh, or not Emma, um, Eva, sorry, Dr. Farrow at Minnesota. 
about g- getting a lot of samples to her so she could have uh, samples for genetics. Um, and so the goal would be to kind of, like we did with the miniature schnauzers, at least just publish like what we know about Yorkies in kidney disease as a group. So that would be a very good point to analysis for the study is to look at the discordant BUN in those dogs and seeing if we have a trend that then might be helpful for either prediction of lesions or associated with the lesions. But it hasn't been something I've looked at specifically. I just know, I know, I will say that when I'm at the EM scope, I will have put the EM slide, I will put the grid on the scope and I'll be like, oh, I bet this is a Yorkie. And I'm right like 85% of the time. Yeah, that's really so. interesting. Yeah, the only other thing that was interesting about this dog was um, her persistent thrombocytosis of about 700,000. Um, which made me consider prior to biopsy results, you know, was there some reactive process occurring? Um, but it doesn't seem like her biopsy is very supportive of a primary, you know, immune process that was driving that. But I mean, I mean, re- she did have a, you know, a, a persistent, I think, pronounced thrombocytosis. Yeah. And I, and to, to be clear, I don't think it's immune complex mediated the immune systems probably right. could still be very well involved but the, I, I, there's not striking definitive like oh this was hit by immune complexes a long time ago and now we've got you know we're in a resolution phase or whatever so it's just kind of like there's material there but it's it's a minor component and we had a, a good number of glomeruli to look at I think they were we were able to look at two different glomeruli on EM and then you had such a number uh, in your core um which does remind me that to discuss, I mean, I don't know if a dog this small, um, sometimes uh, w- w- you guys got a great sample for biopsy. Um, I'm not sure how other people do this, if they decide that they would go in surgically, do it intra-op, like oh, oh, surgically, and then take a needle biopsy. There's a, like a lot of different options, but it can be very uh, scary when, when the animal is this small. And that's why we don't get a lot of cat biopsies as well. It's just, it's just the size of the cats often the, the veterinarians don't have enough. They're just not willing to go ahead and biopsy those dogs or in the small cats. Jenna, uh, in your history of this dog, was there ever a baseline healthy chemistry run on this dog? No, the very first blood work she had was pre-dental in October. Okay, because I'm not sure that the creatinine and BUN are discordant. I don't know what her BUN would have been, but I imagine her creatinine would have been when it, when if she was ever healthy for her size, like 0.3 maybe. I mean, it would have been really low. So it's now, what, five times elevated. And so if the BUN was 20 and it was five times elevated, that would be 100. So I don't know that they're really truly discordant. Um, they just probably look that way. Yeah, and her S- her SDMA would support that as well. Mm-hmm. Her SDMA when we when we when we got it, um, eventually it was twenty seven. Great. And there's also like in, in addition for when I was asking about, do we even have the opportunity to get material from relatives or to to see if the relatives are also proteinuric? Um, also remember that one difference between veterinary nephropathology and human nephropathology which is striking to me is that we have litters when we're dealing with dogs and cats. <laughs> and usually we don't have, we often don't have litters when we're talking about humans. So the runt of the litter often has poor, I mean, has the opportunity to have poor renal function because they didn't have as much time and blood flow during gestation. And we know this from sheep. I'm, got, I'm not going to say we have any experimental data in dogs and cats, but we know from sheep that if there is different implacentation and different perfusion during development, that the smaller the animal, the more likely they're going to have um, uh, less mature kidneys um, at birth. And then the kidney can undergo continue develop for a couple of weeks. And let's just say they're the runt and they're not getting as much um, uh, lactation or nutrition from the mom because they're the runt of the litter. So that's the other thing is that I think that if we ever are going to be able to do a genetic analysis with good um, uh, uh, cohorts of related animals, we're going to have to know which one was, or if they, if there was, you know, a smaller animal within that within that group, because they're all getting their different kinds of blood flow through the different types of, through the placenta, and um, we know that human babies that are born pre- born premature depending on which, how early premature they are, like their kidneys just are not developed. And so if you do not give them time to have renal maturation, those premature babies will age into adults that are more likely to be at end-stage kidney disease at age 30 or 40 
than if they had were not you know if they had had enough time to mature in in utero. I hope that makes sense. Does that make sense to everybody? That's just another uh, interesting piece of thought when it comes to um, the difference between veterinary nephropathology and, and human nephropathology. So we are right at time, however. So um, uh, it did sound I did see on the chat um, uh, that Shelley Baden agreed and Dr. Calgill have agreed with your your kind of maintaining the course when it comes to treatment. Um, and then just, you know, not expecting all that much because at the, according to the biopsy, there's a lot of art, there's already been loss of a lot of nephrons. Um, and so um, uh, you just have to protect the ones that remain. Um, okay, well, I am going to stop this uh, recording. If anybody has any questions or anything like that and you need to reach out to me, please do. Um, and we should be able to have rounds again in February. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks.